Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Yeah, I'd like to welcome you to this uh, final, <coughs> final presentation of the day. And I'd like to thank you all for being present after a long, fascinating, but somewhat tiring day. As you probably have already noticed, English is not my native language. I was born and raised in French, not France, but French. And uh, I learned English by listening to Genesis Deep Purple. <laughs> so you may say, if he has learned English by listening to Deep Purple, right now he should have got enough time to master the language. <laughs> Such a long time ago. Well, I haven't. So please accept my apologies for any kind of mistakes, especially in the kind of pre traumatic stress. I'm, uh, I'm, no, I'm not getting into it. Okay. So the topic of today is our body and type linked. And when I tried to find the title, my extroverted intuition kicked in, and I said, what not about a joke in between body and type and Bonnie and Clyde? And I said, they are the inseparable too. Well, for sure, body and type are going to die together. <laughs> so did Bonnie and Clyde. <laughs> and probably your body and your type are going to be buried together. While Bonnie and Clyde were not granted this. <laughs> they were separated. Okay? But there is more than that to it. Okay? And basically, what I would like to talk to you today is that I would like to make a link in between the topic of this conference, which is type in the digital age, and make a link in between what we can see from the type and from the body when we mix both. So I first talk about my understanding of what the digital age means, go to the type and see what the type can bring in this digital age, and then we will explore what the knowledge of the body can bring to you as type practitioner. So type and digital age. I love this photo. What you see on this photo, you see the real world. I could have taken the woods, the seashore. No, I took pictures of people. And you've got a lady. And this lady is just watching the real world through a screen. That could be a TV, that could be a tablet, that could be a PC, in this case a mobile phone. But she is watching the real world through a screen. And one year ago in Canada, there was a TV show with a guy. He was somewhere in British Columbia, supposed to go from one place to the other, through the woods, the mountains, the rivers, and so ever, with no any equipment. And he had to survive the rain, survive the sun, avoid the wolves, avoid the birds. And in the past, due to my French accent, I would say avoid the bears. Well, I know a lot of men that would write to avoid birds. Men avoiding bees, you don't find that much, okay? <laughs> so, and the guy's there, and it's the woods, and it's raining, and you've got sunshine, and you get perfect pictures. No problem with the sound, no problem with the wind into the microphone, and the light is just perfect. For those of you who have already done a video to put on your mobile, on your website, or YouTube, whatever, you know how complicated this is? You need a good camera, you need a good microphone. I need to switch off the, the air ventilation system in my house, not to get too much noise. And there the guy is just in the woods, supposed to be alone, and you get perfect pictures. It's just fake. But our kids, I used to get more and more of those images. And we don't teach them to say, this is just a picture. This is not the real world. And it's dangerous for mankind. So let's make a small exercise. Would, uh, no, first of all, excuse me. Uh, all we went from analog to digital. And the good news when you speak in front of the TAD community is that most of us, we are old enough to understand what this is. Okay. <laughs> But around 10 years ago, I wanted to listen to my LPs. I went to the cellar, I took the LPs, 
And when my son and my daughter saw my LP, they said to me, hey dad, what's that? And I said, it's to listen to music. And they looked at me and said, come on dad, stop your silly jokes. <laughs> and I said, that's right, it's true. So I had to connect it and to show it. Because when they were born, we had a CD player at all. And when they were teenagers, they had iPods. And you know, like most of the kids, they just don't know the music. And the difference is that the real world is made of that kind of signal. Whether it's my heart rate, the electric conductivity of my skin, uh, the temperature outside, the degree of light, whatever, the signals evolve like this. And what we do out of them to make them digital, we transform them into zero and one. So let's make a small exercise, please. Would one of you tell me what this is? What? Pretty. Pretty? Oh, thank you so much. You like the colors? It's a very close-up pixelated picture of something. Very pixelated picture with dark brown, light brown, a bit of uh, yellow, a bit of white, and some part of blue there. What about this? Is it a this one? Looks like there would be a pattern there. And you see a kind of separation line in between those two zones. Is it shape? Okay, let's see. What about this? Tree. Sky, okay, sea, and the pattern there? Tree. A tree? <coughs> okay. That's exactly the same image. Exactly. I went on the website, royalty free pictures, and I took the picture and I pixelated it more and more. If you want to go from the real world, which is the analog world, to the digital world, you need to take enough samples. You need to observe it during a certain <coughs> amount of time, enough time. And when we do assessments, or we take someone into a coaching session, and after two hours the person is supposed to discover his or her personality profile, are we spending enough time to observe that? It happens sometimes that we say to people, you know, probably it take more time to get there. And we need to measure it with enough precision. Look at what happened in Fukushima. Those guys know that got earthquakes. They were born there. Those guys know that after earthquakes you can get a tsunami. But they also know that they've got only 200 years or so of historical data. So they went into history books and found places maybe a thousand years ago where they got waves. And so they made calculation. And I said, okay, if we got wave there, it means that the wave on the seashore was eight meters high. Okay. But the problem is, are you measuring it here, there, or there? Because if you're measuring it there, it's safe. If you're measuring it there, it's not safe. And we will never know. The only thing we know is that they came to the conclusion that the wave would be 8 meters high. So they built walls of 10 meters high. 25 person margin. But that day, the waves were 40 meters. That day. So to go from the analog world to the digital world, we need to take enough time to measure we need to take enough samples, and we need to have enough precision when we make our measurements. And that's what I want to comment. The technology has become digital. We live in a digital world. But I tend to believe that we too, as human beings, we are becoming digital. Friday and Saturday and Sunday last week, my son was in Morocco, I could follow him lap per lap and see in each sector whether he was gaining time or losing time. At the same time, I could go on the website on a mobile phone and follow what happens in Syria or see something else. 
we are getting more and more information. Most of the time we are not specialists in those information. And most of the time we have less and less and less time to analyze those information. Our PCs have evolved. They are able to process much more information. But we don't. And we get mass information or mass disinformation. Last week on uh, Facebook, there was a joke I liked a lot, which said, in the past, you would have a guy drunk in a bar, and you would say stupidities, and nobody would take care of that. Today, the guy has got a Facebook account, and he's become an annoyance for a lot of people. So we get a lot and lot of information, but which one is true? Which one is fake? And even the media play with this zero-one rule. When I'm listening to the, the television, especially in France in Belgium, but less in Canada, and I'm seeing the way some journalists talk about politics, climate, uh, soccer. I mean, often what I hear is, I'm right, you're wrong. It's a kind of zero-one type of reasoning. Um, we are Friday today, Wednesday, I think it was Wednesday, there was the match real, the Madrid Juventus. Okay, if you watch the film, the, the match, I mean, if you look at the press, some guys say, wow, such a good referee. And some of the guys will say, that's a mess. So we get more and more information. More of it becomes fake. And we get more and more influence of a culture of zero one. So it becomes very difficult to manage this process. Mm -hmm. And I tend to believe that we become more and more zero one. We become more and more digital. But with not enough measurements, not enough samples. And that's why I say it's less time, the zero one mentality. So that's the fake news syndrome we are all living. Okay. Yeah. Uh, just just a clarification. Do, do we know for a fact that we have more fake news? I mean. We used to have less information, uh, but we also used to have uh, gossip going around, and this gossip could live on forever uh, because nobody could look it up to see if it was true. So, is, is the percentage of fake news rising, or are we just getting lots and lots of more of it? The ability to spread it worldwide yes. is so much more important. No, whether as a percentage is it more or less, we should make a study on that, and I wish you good luck to have a kind of methodology that measures something <coughs> that makes sense. But the ability of every one of us to spread <coughs> fake news is just incredibly higher. Look at the discussion today in America. I'm not going to talk about the specifics because that's not my business. But it's amazing. If what some people say is true, that you've got agencies for foreign countries manipulating to social networks people to influence the election, that's really, 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 really a very, very serious case. We haven't been in such a lack of respect between countries for a very long time. So I've taken the example of soccer for our American friends. Because you know you guys in America, you've got football. Who is from America here? Okay. Would you please once explain to me why you call football a game where the playing time, 95% of it, is spent trying to catch the ball with your hands. <laughs> and if you can't catch the ball with your hands, you lose the ball. And the guys on the other team try to avoid you uh, catching the ball with the end. So maybe one day if you couldn't explain to us what you call that football, that would be nice for us. Having said that, I watched the Super Bowl. was really, really great, really great show. Okay? So my understanding, and that's my own belief, and please feel free to, to accept it, to go against it, is that not only is the, the, the technology going digital, but we also as human beings are going more and more digital. And that's dangerous for mankind. Look at what happens today in the US, that's very dangerous. So what about type? Well, type is different. Type is a mix of colors. And type basically was made to reconcile opposites. 
Or can you reconcile opposites if there are opposites? There are no opposites. There are polarities. I had a talk with you, Sue, this morning. STJ, NFP. And we came exactly to the same conclusion about the way we like to learn things. And it was so nice for me to hear, sometimes I feel stupid in the room because the amount of time I feel stupid in the room is amazing. Okay? So, Taif was made to reconcile opposites in a way that we understand that there are no opposites. There are just polarities. You can't have a North Pole if you don't have the South Pole. And the magnetic fields go from one to the other, and it goes to circulate. And type is not static, it's dynamic. That's why you and me were so different, and probably if we go to the restaurant, it would be a hard time for you waiting for me to uh, decide, <coughs> and I will be so impressed by the way you decide quickly. But we are no opposite, we are just polarities. Okay? And therefore, once you understand type, you understand that there is no wrong, there is no good, there is no bad, there is no right. And therefore, type gives us a possibility to <coughs> stop with the one fits all, as one size fits all type of approaches. The number of time in the training room, I'm going to say to the people, stop please thinking that to motivate people, you've got to explain them the why of a task. Because when we do role play, and I see some intuitive spending amount of time and time to explain the why, sometimes I see some sensing just getting mad and saying, just explain me what I need to do. And often what I will see is that sensing perceiving is explaining me what I've got to do. Sensing judging is explaining me what I've got to do and oh, you want me to do it. Often sensing perceiving, just see me what and <coughs> give me a break, I'll find the road by myself. Another example, uh, my wife got a lady uh, for coaching. The lady was undergoing the final stage of a burnout. When I say the final stage, I mean that the public authorities had said, we stopped paying you, so you've got to get back to the work. And she was undergoing a psychotherapy, <coughs> and the guy had said, why don't you do some mindfulness? And she got serious. And she said to my wife, you know, even that, I'm not able to do it. And when I came back at home, in the evening, my wife told me, you know, I believe she's an INFP. And I believe it's not going to work. And so I met the lady at the next uh, coaching session. And she was indeed an INFP. And I said, why don't you stop with this mindfulness? It's a perfect tool. But in the state you are as an INFP, it calls to function that you have a hard time using in the normal time. And today you are in a weak period of your life. Forget about it. And she said, what could I do? I said, oh, I've got a technique which is quite quite new, brand new technique, go in the woods <laughs> and walk and let your brain play and yet let your extroverted intuition just play because this is her auxiliary function, it's going to have a difficult time and after a few weeks of this quite new and complicated treatment, she was already much better. So type, the richness of type, is that it helps us to say there is nothing wrong, there is nothing good. Most of the time when something is not going fine for you, it's just because the methodology which has been used with you is not the right one for you. Okay? And therefore, the more perspective you're going to integrate, the better it will be. And therefore, it's my belief that if type wants to bring this kind of richness that our digital world uh, put in danger, it should incorporate as much perspective as possible. Marcus Briggs, of course, Jung, John Beebe, which is not on the slide, but uh, which for me is very important, but also the temperaments. I suppose we talked about the temperaments a couple of minutes ago, but also the interaction styles of uh, Linda, Linda Berners. 
And some of the lenses, one of the lenses I love the most is the conflict management lens of Damian Killer. And that's where the body comes into play. That the body can also be a lens. So let's have a look at that. You see the lady there? Okay. She's not playing football, although she's American. Okay. And if you see where the ball is, the ball is there, and I suppose that the tra trajectory of the ball is going to be this way. Look at her. <coughs> Look at her head. The head is straight. The head is not tilted backwards, which means that the ball is going to come on that side of her high side, not this way. If you would be using this part of her high side, you would see her head like this. No, her head is horizontal, and she has not tilted it backwards. That's just a photo. And I said a few minutes ago, we need to have enough samples. So I'm going to be very cautious now. If the way she plays there, with her head horizontal, is representative of the way she naturally tends to play, and the way she naturally feels comfortable with, well, ladies and gentlemen, this lady is intuitive. Look at the other lady there. Look at her head. Look at the back. The back is completely backwards. It's tilted backwards. And yet a bit also. And, and the way she looks totally different. That's a totally different way of playing, <coughs> which sends different language. Look at that guy here, the guy with the white shirt. He's trying to keep the ball with, for him. I don't know or you guys say that in English. In French, we have a very funny way of telling that. We are saying he's trying to protect the ball. You say the same in English? Yeah. Yes. If I was a linguist, I would do a PhD on that. <laughs> Why are we saying to a ball that we are trying to protect the ball <laughs> while we just try to keep it for us? <laughs> Some mother do that to their children too. I'm trying to protect you, my kid. No, you just try to keep me from yourself. Okay? And so, trying to protect, between quote, the ball, the guy puts his body a bit to the back because it increases the distance between the ball and the next player, which makes it more difficult for the player to get the ball. And he puts his arms like this, so it's more difficult to go around him. It's totally normal that he plays this way. But, if this picture is representative of the way the guy likes to play, and the way he tends to play naturally, and the way he feels comfortable to play, well, this guy is a sensing, and he's either an introvert perceiving or an extrovert judging. Okay? Look at this guy, the, the, the kid there, the, the, the kid with the yellow shirt. He said he's a bit tilted to the front. And look, his arms are a bit far from the body. Look, the guy with the green shirt. Look, the, the position of that is totally different. And look at the arms. The arms are close to the body. Well, this guy, if this is representative of his usual way of playing, well, he is either introvert judging or extrovert perceiving. And look at this guy there. Look at his arms. And here in the UK, you've got a Belgian player. His name is Fellaini. Often he will get a red card or yellow card when he jumps to get the ball. Because often he jumps like this. Well, I wouldn't say he's a nice guy. Probably he's a nice guy in life, but on the field he's not such a nice guy. But I believe he's an, he's a, an horizontal guy. And those guys, when they jump, they've got to be like this. He can't jump this way. And of course, as I said, well, he's not the too, uh, too much nice guy on the field. But, yeah. Look at this guy. Look at the arms. Close to the body. Probably he's slowing down because this guy just kicked the ball. Look at that one. Look at the arms. Those are all indications of tendencies in the way to move, the way to play, and it gives indication. How do we know that? Well, I believe that respecting copyright is not only a matter of respecting the people that form something, 
it's also a matter of respecting yourself. And so what I'm going to talk to you uh, was discovered by two guys, Bertrand, Bertrand Terola and Ralph, Ralph Ippoli. Bertrand is a Swiss guy. Uh, he used to give training to sport coaches in, uh, in Switzerland uh, to get them to be uh, authorized to, to be uh, sport coaches. And Ralph uh, was the uh, coach of the feminine uh, Olympic team of France. He went to the Olympic Games and so on. And they have discovered a model which is called Action Tops. And this is their website in case you want to know more about what I'm telling you. And over uh, 25 years, they have looked at a series of sets. They went into what Pribram said. They went into what Benziger said. And I know that today Benziger is a bit of a weak link because Benziger said, well, we've got right, left, frontal, uh, back part of the brain. And we know now, especially with the, all what the analysis uh, that he was doing, that it's much more complicated than that. But yet, I'm going to talk to you about the results we can get with action. Then uh, that they also look at what Berthoz said. Berthoz is a Frenchman. And he found very interesting stuff. Let's imagine for a minute that I'm a robot. And I'm moving my uh, mechanical fingers to put this in the control. Mathematically, my computer will have to do some signal processing doing mathematical integration, mathematical differentiation, otherwise not going to be stable. And that's what happened in all robots. I'm not a robot, I'm a human being. But the mathematics don't change. So somewhere in my body, there must be something that do mathematical calculations, integration, differentiation, so that I can do that in a stable way. Well, what Berto has shown is that all those calculations don't happen in the brain. They happen along the nerve trackers, which means that part of our intelligence is inside the body. And that's the most important part of the model, which says that part of the intelligence is distributed inside the body. Then they went and they looked at what, so what Soye did. Okay? Soye was a friend, uh, Benjamin. He studied the way people walk. If you look, for example, at someone like Lewis Hamilton, my dear Lewis Hamilton, he's a bit always like this backward, and he's going to push his foot on the ground, take, and go for the next step. And he's always like this, very anchored into the ground. If you know the French film, Les Vacances de Monsieur Hulot, Mr. Hulot, well, the guy is always walking like this. Well, Lewis Hamilton is a walking by the bottom type of guy, and the other one is a walking by the top. And so he made an extensive analysis of all of that. And then finally, we've got Denise Treuf, who was also Belgian. She studied the kind of posture you will be at. If you look in the street, you may see some people that are like this. And other people that are like this. And some of them are straight, straight. Some of them are a bit like me. Okay? By the way, the INFP friends, we are the ones that get the most change for becoming hunched backed soon in life. INFP is the worst combination to become hunched backed. And some people are a bit like this. Some people are more open. And what Ralph and Bertrand have been doing was connect all those pieces of information. And they did that for 25 years by observing sport people but also by doing testing. And I've been able to define a whole series of correlation, combination that were extensively tested. And since January 1st, 2017, I've started to do my own statistics, which are not reliable yet because when I started those, I was still a bit too soon in my learning curve to make sure of my testing. And I estimate that, except in July, August, I tested around one to two people a week. So let's assume 65 weeks, you removed July, August, 